excellent. So I will just uh, share my screen uh, first. Uh, Let me just minimize this. Probably, uh, well, uh, my name is uh, Rui. I'm a solution architect uh, at Agera. Um, and uh, uh, well, I have been with the company for about one, one year and a half. Uh, I am based in Cork. Uh, we, we look after the EMEA market and usually I'm not part of the uh, the developer advocacy team, but well, I was uh, requested to you know assist in, in this. Uh, and this will be top. Uh, today, uh, what we will do is uh, we will see Calico, um, the, the open source project. Um, let me just probably start my presentation. Just close this. So uh, basically, um, Calico is uh, an open source project that was uh, founded by the company I work for, which is uh, Tagera, and is maintained as well uh, by us. Um, essentially, this is the first series of the, the meetups uh, talks that we will do. So the idea of this one is uh, to do a very entry level for people who, who, who is not familiar to probably the, the project or uh, even uh, Kubernetes it, it itself, right? So um, without uh, anything else, uh, let me just uh, talk uh, a bit about what Project Calico. Project Calico is, uh, uh, well, the, the community uh, which develops and maintains, uh, you know, Calico, which is an open source networking uh, as a, a network security solution. Uh, for containers, um, virtual machines, and host-based workloads. That means that uh, Calico is used as a, a CNI for uh, Kubernetes uh, environments, but it can uh, it, it not only handles the networking within a Kubernetes environment, but it uh, uh, takes care about the network security as well. So uh, you will be uh, I will be talking about a bit about uh, why we need uh, network security in, in a Kubernetes environment. And uh, it can work, uh, I mean, it's, it's well known for working in Kubernetes environments, but it can work as well as um, in order to protect uh, virtual machines and standalone holes. In that case, Calico won't run as a pod, but it will run as a service in, in that uh, VM or that bare metal host. So, um, this uh, project, uh, well, uh, there are some links in there, uh, so you can contact us uh, if you want uh, to know more about the project, to Im involve yourself on it as well, uh, or if you have any question, if you are using it and, and you need to contact the, the developers uh, for, for Calico, those are, are the links. Uh, just to say that Calico powers up more than a million nodes. Um, we, we have over 1 billion uh, Docker pools, and uh, well, uh, more than 150 contributors. Uh, it's used in more than 160, uh, 160 countries around the world. And yeah, you have, you have the, the uh, numbers in there and, and the context. So uh, as I said, we will start from the very beginning, the very basics uh, of uh, Calico in a Kubernetes environment. And for that, and to explain why Calico, or what brings Calico to you, uh, I will explain uh, or start explaining what uh, the Kubernetes network model uh, is, right? So basically uh, you have uh, these uh, pods running in your Kubernetes environment where the pod is the, uh, low, and the lowest unit in a Kubernetes is the atomic unit, uh, you know, in, in a Kubernetes environment and a pod can run more than one container. So every pod, when you deploy a, a pod in your system, there will be several uh, proce processes uh, within Kubernetes and the main process is Kubelet, which is the brain of Kubernetes uh, in, in, that is war, uh, running in a, in a node, in a Kubernetes node. And then uh, it will you know, uh, request uh, you know, to the container running time engine to create this pod. And then it will look after what is called the CNI, which is a plugin, in order to plumb the networking for that uh, specific uh, pod. The pod will get an, uh, an address, an IP address. It, it will be, every pod will get its own address. But as I said, every pod can con uh, run more than one container. So if you're running several containers within a pod, those will be sharing that IP address. And then they can communicate each other freely without any, any restriction, right? Uh, what, uh, and, and that's what usually is called a sidecar uh, you know, container uh, and why you would like to have more than one uh, container per pod, even if the most common thing is uh, to have few 
containers, one or few containers only, but the, the, one of the reasons can be logging. For example, you have an application, Apache server, and you want to log that um, uh, you know, a specific container, you, you create a sidecar container for logging in that same pod. So that, that will be uh, what the CNI will do. It, well, the, the, the IPAM plugin within the CNI and I will talk about the different plugins that you can have, but well, it will apply, uh, uh, assign an IP address to that uh, pod, and then the pods will be able to talk each other. It is important to mention that uh, the pods do not need to live in the same subnet. So in this example, you are seeing two pods that are uh, you know, networked to the same uh, subnet, but you can have a, within the same cluster, you can have nodes that are in a different subnet uh, that are part from the same cluster, and you can have pods even, uh, you know, networked, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in different ranges. I mean, you can have several IP pools and they can be in different subnets as well. So just to clarify that not necessarily they need to be in the same subnet. And then uh, this is uh, how the Kubernetes model will be. I mean, the, the, main, pre the main premise of the Kubernetes model is that the pods do not have any restriction in order to talk to each other. I mean, a pod will freely talk to any other pod in a, in a, in a cluster. That's, that's what the cloud network, the networking uh, foundation, uh, you know, um, uh, says. I mean, it's, it's the, the model they came with. And then uh, basically there will be no natting between those pods. So those pods can communicate free to, freely and there is no natting uh, be between them. So in order to, you know, restrict, uh, you know, the communication across pods, because at the end uh, in, a, in a cluster, uh, if a pod is compromised, you can see that uh, as it can reach basically any other pod in, in your environment, that can be uh, a big problem of, uh, or, or security problem, right? If a pod gets compromised. So you need a mechanism in order to avoid uh, or to you know, uh, uh, de deter this, this communication across pods uh, eventually to some of the pods. And the, the way to do that is through uh, what is called network policies. So basically, uh, this is an analogy. I mean, if you are not familiar to Kubernetes, uh, you will have one IP per pod. So you can think of this as VM and pro pro processes, right? Uh, VMs will be more or less the equivalent what a pod will be and processes what those containers inside the pod will be because they will be microservices that are fulfilling a purpose, right? Uh, so uh, the way in order to get isolation in that network policy uh, is, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, that isolation in that network is through the means of network policy because we have a simple flat network. There is another thing impor important because I mentioned uh, the, the pod uh, subnet can be different pools, not necessarily the same. The Kubernetes nodes that are running these pods will have likely a different network. They can share the same net network as the pods, but likely they will have a different network. So no matter what the case is, uh, you can you know, uh, send the packets of the pods with Calico. You can send them uh, you know, uh, in, in a, without any kind of uh, encapsulation, uh, no overlay at all. So your underlay physical network will see those uh, you know, packets coming from the pods with the addresses that they have. And basically what we do, I, I won't enter into detail on that, but we do, uh, we use BGP in order to an announce the IP pools of, of the different pods in different nodes, or you can use an encapsulation. However, the Kubernetes network model that do not prescribe how you need to do this. So uh, the important thing about the Kubernetes network model is every pod can communicate with any other pod, no NAT across pods, the only way to limit the communication between pods is through the network policy. And those, uh, different, those two different things reside in different places within a Kubernetes uh, environment. I believe there are some, some questions, probably. OK, cool. Uh, excellent. So uh, I will talk about, um, we, we talk about, mentioned several things, right? Uh, we mentioned uh, Kubernetes node, we mentioned Kubelet, which is the brain of the Kubernetes environment. And then every time Kubelet needs to implement a pod, it will need to request some, somehow an address for it. So the 
after it uh, tells the container runtime engine to create the pod, it will contact the CNA plugin. And then eventually, uh, this if the CNA plugin is doing the, the IPAM, which is the management of the IP address of the pod as well, uh, then it will you know, probably request that uh, to the uh, a specific plugin for the IPAM, which Calico does as well. And then once the pod is deployed, uh, Kubelet will request this. And then essentially Calico will assign an IP address to the pod. And then it will create a virtual Ethernet pair between the pod and the node. Uh, so the, the pod will be networked into, into that uh, Kubernetes node. And uh, you, know, you will use the, the node uh, routing table in order to route the traffic. Of course, Calico will, you know, uh, modify the, the 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 network table, the route table in the node, uh, if it is using BGP or, uh, you know, if it is using an overlay as well. Uh, there will be a, a a route for that overlay in that uh, Kubernetes node, right? So that's basically essentially what Calico does. Um, I would like to because I, I was um, we were discussing yesterday, and the idea is that you will be able to implement Calico if it is uh, if you are new to Calico. Uh, so after the session or ideas that you will be able to uh, implement it. So uh, just after this slide, I will probably uh, jump into uh, how to, you know, you will install Calico uh, and probably we can see a bit of what I'm explaining here in terms of the CNI. But just uh, before that, I just want to mention that th there can be several plugins, uh, uh, you know, network plugins in, in your environment. It doesn't need to be only Calico. Uh, you can have, for example, the host, uh, local IPAN, just giving the addresses and Calico taking care of the uh, networking part. Or you can have other CNI plugins, for example, to handle multiple interfaces. Uh, Multus is an example of this kind of plugin. You can have a, a plugin just uh, handling the CNI uh, and IPAM part, and then another plugin just taking care of the network policies, the enforcement of the network policies. Uh, there was a person that was asking about AKS and Calico, how Calico works in AKS. The thing is that Calico, uh, Yes, Calico can be, uh, in fact, is the, the default choice or the preferred, pre preferred choice in order to do network policies in AKS clusters. However, uh, Microsoft uses the, their own plugin, which is the, you know, the Azure, uh, Azure uh, plugin, uh, CNI, right? Uh, so in that case, uh, you will deploy the AKS cluster, it will use the Azure CNI and Calico will handle the network policy. However, they just uh, released recently something that is called uh, Bring Your Own CNI, in which you can uh, experiment and uh, use Calico for both the network policies and the uh, and, uh, uh, CNI itself. So you will deploy the cluster without a plugin and then install Calico on top of it. But it's a preview uh, feature. So if, if you want to try, obviously, it's something you can do now. But uh, otherwise, you will use Calico as the network policy uh, CNI, uh, uh, sorry, plugin, and then use uh, Azure CNI in that case. So that's a good example on working with different uh, plugins with, uh, within the same Kubernetes cluster. So I will jump uh, into you know uh, how to start uh, working with Calico uh, for those that are not familiar with it. Just uh, let me just make sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. That is a network address relation. Sorry for that. Um, so basically, the idea is the pods will communicate each other with the IP that they have been assigned. So no, nobody will be natting that traffic between the pods. So the pods can communicate, see each other, uh, the original IP that they had. And that's uh, really something nice because you do not rely in uh, network address translation, which is uh, uh, it can be limiting and, and it doesn't work well with some even some protocols. Uh, network address translation is used extensively in internet because uh, well we we are limited in, in, the, in the terms of IP version four addresses and was a technology that was born because of that because well essentially what you wanted to extend the life of those IP version four addresses. So you will have a public IPs and you will not your uh, internal IPs on, on those. With IP version six, that's uh, slightly changing because we well, we have more IP addresses uh, 
available. And, and one of the main benefits is, uh, of IP version six is uh, that you really do not need to rely in, in NAT uh, in order to communicate. So let, let me just uh, jump uh, very quickly, we'll move this just very quickly to, um, uh, to the project page. Uh, if you go to projectcalico.org, uh, uh, this will be, well, the main page is uh, Project Calico, like this. this uh, is the main page of the project, projectcalico.docs.tagero.io. Uh, That's uh, you know, where you will start with. Um, I have uh, here uh, a cluster uh, that has been deployed. Um, this is a vanilla Kubernetes environment. Uh, it has uh, three nodes. Uh, as you can see, the nodes are not ready. And the reason they are not ready is because there is no CNI uh, uh, hey, deployed. Uh, hey, uh, Rui, can you increase the font size? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that. Perfect. Yep. Better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did for my, my, my terminal window, but I forgot to do it for this, sorry. No so no. Uh, then you have uh, three, three nodes and they are basically not ready because no plugin has been installed uh, yet. Um, I just, uh, before even we start with this, uh, I will, because I was what, uh, talking about that, uh, probably let me just switch like this. So if I, um, you know, if you see uh, what it, this is a node, uh, one of, of the Kubernetes nodes is, is a different environment. So for example, if I do a status uh, kubelet, I just want to show you something. Uh, when you start Kubernetes uh, kubelet in this case, um, you know, there will be a config file as you can see here, uh, they, which will tell kubelet where to find the information about uh, all these, uh, uh, all the information you need to run. And we, within those, uh, there will be, uh, you know, a CNI, uh, you know, a standard file. And then you are telling basically that you will use a CNI uh, for this environment, right? So if you look at the, there is a directory that uh, Kubelet will look in this case by default, uh, which is this one, uh, is etc CNI uh, netd. And then there are, there could be several files in here and the files will be read in lexicographic order. That means that if there is a number, it will, first read this file in, in case you have multiple plugins. Uh, as I said, you can have multiple plugins. In this case, it will look for this, um, this file, uh, Tencalico. And then uh, this is a conventional, uh, th there is a convention on how this file must look like. So in this case, we are specifying the plugins. We are specifying that Calico will be our plugin uh, or CNI plugin. And I am using Calico as well for the IPAM, uh, for the assignment of IP addresses. And I am using Calico as well for, for the policy in this case. So basically uh, uh, then, uh, so let me get out of there. So I just, just wanted to show you that before we jump uh, into uh, the cluster that is empty, this, this other cluster, uh, sorry, is the, in the browse. Uh, this other cluster doesn't have any anything installed. So uh, Calico supports several kind of uh, different kinds of environments. Uh, you can support managed public cloud environments. We we mentioned AKS, but well, we we can support other uh, environments as well from cloud providers. And then uh, what we will do is install Calico uh, to follow the quick start guide. Uh, in this case, we are installing in a vanilla Kubernetes cluster. This cluster has been installed with kubeadm, which is uh, uh, the most probably the mo one of the most popular installers uh, for vanilla Kubernetes. And as you can see, there are just basically two steps um, to, to run Calico. This is a really easy uh, way to install. Uh, so once you have your cluster installed, your Kubernetes cluster installer, but there is no plugin in there, uh, and you have a kubectl cl uh, client, uh, so you can run these commands. Then basically you will apply two manifest files. You will apply the Tiger operator and the custom resources files. So the, all the uh, Calico is the, all the life cycle of Calico is managed by the operator. So in this case, we will be installing the operator. So uh, we create the operator. So as you can see, there are several pods that are running and there are several ports that are pending. 
The reason why is because uh, these pods are uh, hooked to the host network namespace. They are using the same IP as the host, so they do not require IPAM to give them an IP address. Otherwise, you cannot bootstrap the cluster, right? So there, there should be pods that are able to communicate without needing an IP address from the IPAM. Uh, you, you need those to be first ready, right? And they are using basically the same IP as the nodes. And the Tigera operator is not no exception. So if I see, for example, if I do ctl get nodes, uh, you will see that uh, these are the IPs of my nodes, uh, 10, uh, 0, 120, 30, and 31. And if I see my pods in here uh, and all my namespaces, uh, you will see that uh, the pods that are running are using the same uh, IP as the host. They do not need IPAM to be ready in order to start. And that's one of the cases with the operator. There will be other pods are core, as core DNS, for example, which is a critical component of Kubernetes that uh, needs to be assigned an IP uh, by uh, uh, you know, the IPAM functionality. And until this is not ready, obviously my, my environment won't, won't work. And the reason it, it doesn't have an IP is because still Calico is not running. We, just deploy the operator, which will manage the life cycle of the installation. So it will deploy the pods, it will recycle the pods if they have a problem, it will assist in upgrades. Uh, when you upgrade Calico, basically what you uh, change is the operator. And then the operator will realize you are running an older version of Calico and will start terminating those pods and then uh, one by one, and then um, installing the new version of, of Calico uh, uh, on top. So that's the first step. And the second step, uh, which is, you can see is very easy, is just to create this file. But before creating this file, uh, there is something we, we need to check because um, I installed this Kubernetes cluster. And then at the time of installation, I said to kubelet which IP range it will use. So it's important that you follow the same convention, that you follow the, exactly the same range that was given. So in, in or, in, instead of applying the file directly, what I will do is uh, I will download the file so we can take a look at it. So uh, yeah, just downloaded the file. And then if I do cost resources, as you can see, there is uh, two resources here that are defined. Uh, one resource is uh, the installation. As you can see the, the, the API version of this. Uh, Kubernetes is, has an extendable uh, API, so you can use uh, custom resource definitions in order to extend their API. And you can see that uh, this uh, API group is, is uh, belongs to the operator, so the, the operator uh, understands a resource that is called installation. And basically the resource says, well, you will install Calico. And then these are the parameters that I, I will use. As I said, Calico can encapsulate the traffic, but it's not necessarily needed. I mean, you can or can uh, not necessarily need to do it. Uh, but uh, and it will install an API server for Calico as well. So you will be able to use API groups that are understood by Calico in order to deploy objects that Calico understands. Um, the, the thing that is important to make sure is that the, when I installed the Kubernetes cluster, the IP range for the pods that I define it with the installer matches what Calico is expecting. That's basically the only thing that you need really to, to make sure you are uh, modifying, right? So let me, um, let me uh, show you uh, or, or, or and at the same time see which uh, pod I define it because I really don't, don't remember. So if I get my config maps, there is something that is uh, called config maps. In this case, um, kube system in the my kube system namespace. So I will have a uh, kube IDM creates a config map with all the configuration that was uh, given to it. So I can, I can just probably describe this uh, because the output will be nicer to read. To read. Uh, and as you can see, this is the pod subnet that I define it at the time of installation. The only thing that I need really to change from this two-step process is to make sure that the pod range matches with what whatever uh, you know I install it in in Kubernetes, right? And this is more or less detailed uh, detail uh, above. But what I will do is I will uh, just uh, get this, and I I will uh, change my config map. So sorry, my my resource. So basically what I will do here is um, 
uh, tell that I will use that pool. And probably I will change this to APMP. I do not want to use VXLAN. So, uh, I mean, I could, but as a, not the, a big deal, but probably I will just use uh, IP and IP encapsulation. So I, now I can just deploy this. Uh, so I create, I'm sorry, create this resource, uh, custom resources. And then this will basically install uh, to, uh, you know, apply the installation and the API server resource that we saw before. And then the operator will uh, realize, I want to install Calico. Once it sees the installation resource, it will start and start deploying pods uh, in this environment. So if we, I see the pods that are being deployed, as you can see, this is Calico basically um, uh, being deployed. Um, Calico has several components. Um, the, the main component of Calico is what is called Calico node. Uh, this one that is here. Calico node will run as a daemon set. Uh, for people that we, who is not familiar to Kubernetes, uh, a daemon set is a pod that you deploy in every single node. So, um, you know, uh, sometimes you have deployments where you will say how many pods will be deployed and so on. You have replica sets that will tell you the number of replicas you want for a specific pod. For example, you are installing a, an Apache and you will say, well, I want five replicas for it. Uh, but in case of a daemon set, automatically it will uh, don a, a, a pod per node. If I have three nodes in this case, it will deploy three Calico nodes, uh, one Calico in each node. And Calico node is the one that will handle, you know, uh, will handle the processes that uh, you know, do the the uh, assignment, uh, uh, you know, uh, of IPs, the uh, uh, virtual Ethernet pair. I mean, the, this interface that it creates for the pods themselves to be attached to the Kubernetes node, it will do that. Uh, it will do handle the network policies as well. So when I implement the filtering through the network policies, it will be Calico who will be doing this. And then there are a couple more of uh, components. Uh, I probably I will stop here and just uh, see how it is going. Uh, well, uh, there is a, an error in an Nginx pod, but that's not important for now. I mean, the, what is important for us is uh, the Calico components have been deployed. And then apart from the nodes, there are uh, three more components you can see here. One is the API server. The API server basically what will do is when I uh, create a Calico object, I will call this API group and it will be handled by the API server. Kubernetes knows that there is a, if I do kubectl get API service, uh, Kubernetes know that uh, I have extended uh, the API through through this uh, service, uh, and this is uh, it will redirect those calls to these uh, guys to these pods. I have uh, another component that is Kube controllers, which is really important to what we will discuss today. It has several uh, controllers, but one of the tasks that it does is uh, all the Kubernetes network policies are based on labels and selectors. Because when you implement security in a Kubernetes environment, the pods will be uh, you know, getting these IPs in a dynamic way. It, they will be recycled. They will get a different IP. They will be deleted. Uh, you, know, uh, you will scale out the, your deployments. So you never know which uh, IPs they will get at the end. So you cannot base your network security in uh, you know, legacy constructs like IPs. So basically what we use is labels and selectors in order to implement those, to select those pods and implement the network policies on it. And I will explain this in more in detail and give you some examples of it. But the, the thing is that every time a pod is deployed and it has a label, uh, you know, uh, Kube controllers is who tracks this, you know, it, it knows exactly which, la which labels have uh, every pod. And if a network policy needs to be applied to a pod, it will, you know, do this, this task uh, uh, of matching those pods and so on. So it, it will track those, those labels, uh, basically, that, that's what I want to say. And then you will have Calico Typha, and Calico Typha is just um, another pod that is uh, sits between the Calico nodes and the Kube API server. So a Kubernetes API server. So basically it's just to uh, the multiplex messages between, imagine you have a hundred nodes. Uh, you do not want every node 
connecting to the Kubernetes API server because that will load a lot, the Kubernetes API server. So basically you want to uh, funnel those connections through Calico Typha. So basically you start with only two Calico Typha pods and they will you know, do the, the multiplexing of all messages, uh, catching and this kind of stuff. And then if you grow in terms of nodes, uh, I believe is every 100 nodes, a new Calico Typha will be deployed and then all the Calico nodes will be uh, you know, being proxied by Calico Typha in order to get to Kubernetes uh, API server. So let me see if uh, probably that pod uh, recovered. Well, there is uh, some issue with this uh, Nginx pod, but that's, well, really not relevant to what I wanted to, to show you. Uh, basically, all uh, you know, the rest of the pods are are just running, and as you can see, they will be getting IP addresses, uh, you know, in the range that I specified. So these IPs, I mean, differently to these ones, which is uh, are the host uh, IPs. These IPs are being, uh, you know, landed by Calico, right? So, for example, if I go to into a node, uh, just to show you how that will look like. Uh, uh, basically, if I do an IP route in here, you will see that uh, you know those IPs will be seen as directly connected to an interface that Calico created. So the pod got its IP and is connected to an interface in that uh, Kubernetes node. So that's uh, pretty much uh, you know how you will install Calico. Uh, let me just probably get back to the presentation. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm already there. Is just uh, today I'm working with just one monitor, which is always challenging. So um, cool. Uh, that's uh, basically uh, you know a, a very high level overview. Uh, as I said, uh, I mean there is a lot uh, to talk about uh, in there, but uh, I hope that gave you at least uh, an idea on how to start with Calico, how you can install it, um, you know, what probably you need to look for and more or less how the Kubernetes network model uh, is, which is important to understand the next concept that we are going to talk about. And that next concept is uh, network policies. So uh, we were talking about, well, pods, uh, the pods are sitting there, uh, they, they get this IP assigned by IPAM, they get their interface created by the CNI connected to the node. The CNI will, will take care on how to route that traffic uh, if needed, but they will basically modify the host uh, routing table in order to, to get that host, uh, uh, you know, communicating uh, the, 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 the pods. And, uh, but the important thing here is that the pods can communicate to each other without restriction, without NAT, they can just, you know, try to contact a service in a different pod and they will be able to do that. So we are talking about a flat network, right? So uh, the isolation is not defined by the structure of the network. No matter if I have a node in a different subnet or if I am using different IP pools, I, as you saw, I, I use it as a very big, large IP pool for all my pods, but I could just decided to split that uh, pool that I installed with Kubernetes in a smaller pools. In that installation resource, I could have decided to do a smaller pool and then create another pools uh, on my own, right? I can do that as well. But at the end, uh, the important thing here is that, uh, you know, the physical network won't define how the pods can communicate each other. It will be just a simple, big, flat uh, network, right? So we need a mechanism in order to avoid those pods communicating each other. And the way uh, they, we will do it is with network policy. So network policy can see as a firewall between the pods. So I will try to, to uh, just uh, let the pods uh, that uh, need to communicate with other specific pods uh, to do so. Uh, and there is an important concept. And, and the concept is that Calico relies on the Kubernetes data store in order to uh, you know, store all its objects. So uh, whenever you create a network policy, the network policy will live in the ETCD data store, uh, the KDD data store of Kubernetes. Uh, and whenever you create that network policy, uh, that, that's one thing. But the other important thing to know is that for whenever you create a network policy in Kubernetes, uh, you need 
uh, plugging in order to enforce that policy. With, with, with this, what I mean is, even if, if Kubernetes understand uh, what a network policy is, and you can, you know, you basically can do this if you do uh, API resources. Uh, if I look for uh, just a minute, if I look for network uh, policy, as as you can see, I mean Kubernetes uh, will understand what uh, a network policy is. I mean Kubernetes has uh, its own in its own API group will understand what a Kubernetes network policy is. But the, the problem here is that uh, if you do not have a plugin enforcing that network policy. Kubernetes API will say, okay, you created the network policy, all good, but uh, it will create the resource in the ETC data store, but really no one will be enforcing that uh, network policy. So Kubernetes uh, you know, allows you to create network policies even if you do not have a policy plugin uh, which, which enforced uh, that uh, policy. Uh, and you know, policy uh, plugins as Flannel and, and this uh, you know, more basic, uh, um, uh, plugins, uh, you know, won't implement a network policy. So even if they can uh, act as a CNI, they won't enforce the network policy. So even if Kubernetes API doesn't complain, the network call policy won't be enforced. And that's what Calico is doing in this case. I mean, the network plugin in this case, uh, which is Calico, will make sure that whatever network policy you have specified, that policy is uh, instantiated or is installed in those uh, nodes. So. Uh, and, and that's the second most important thing that Calico does, apart from you know uh, networking those pods, uh, is just to isolate in the traffic when needed, right? And uh, because you, by you know, uh, by all means, you would like to uh, not allow every pod to com to communicate with every every other pod, because otherwise you are having a very large attack surface. I mean, if a pod is compromised. The, the the size of your uh, 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 the, the attack surface in that case will be the size of the cluster, right? Because eventually that pod will communicate with any other pod within that cluster. So you would like to implement network policies in order to prevent that. Um, so this is uh, you know how a network policy uh, look like in Kubernetes. This is a Kubernetes network policy. Uh, I must say first uh, of all of all. So you see that the API group is the one that we saw before. Is the, is an API group uh, you know. Uh, uh, which is one of the main API groups in, in, in Kubernetes. And then the kind is a network policy. So let's see what that network policy has and uh, you know, more or less understand what, what this is doing. So basically you have a name for this policy. Uh, that policy lives in a namespace. I mean, all the, um, not, not all, but uh, a lot of uh, Kubernetes uh, resources are namespaced. So you likely will have a namespace for production, for staging, and then you will create your pods, the relevant pods in there. And then, well, you can do things like RBAC and other things uh, uh, it, within Kubernetes in order to kind of uh, have uh, some sort of uh, isolation for that. Um, specific environment. But uh, at the end, uh, Kubernetes network policies, the important part here is that they, they are namespaced. And then you uh, have these specs for this policy. So the first uh, most important thing here is the pod selector. So you will like to apply this policy in certain pods, right? And the pods uh, that I want to apply the policy uh, to are the ones that uh, match this label. Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, so basically, I, I, I'm matching these labels. Uh, the label is uh, color uh, blue in this case. And then uh, this is an ingress policy. Uh, so this is matching my pod. So the policy will apply to this pod. And then I have this rule for, for my ingress. I can have a rule, rules for ingress, for egress. In this case, what I'm saying is if the traffic comes from uh, any other pod, this selector is not the same as this. This is within a rule, so that means that this is matching the traffic, not, not the pod where I am applying the policy. So in this case, uh, if the traffic comes from any other pod that has uh, this label, uh, color uh, red, equal, equals red, uh, to port 80 in this uh, uh, other pod that is blue, then the traffic will be allowed. Everything else, by definition, in a Kubernetes network policy will be denied. So once I match this policy, I'm matching this 
in these endpoints that has this label, and then all the traffic that comes from these other pods that has this label to my port 80, then I will allow the traffic. Everything else will be denied in ingress for that pod. So uh, just to show you uh, one more thing, yes, let me go back. So for example, if I, uh, or probably let me just show you here, uh, kubectl get, oops. CTL get pods, uh, and then I use a label. Uh, my label will be, for example, I believe, uh, well, in the nam namespace job bank, and my label will be um, tenant equal tenant one. I believe I have that label. So as you can see, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, my pods will have several different labels. Uh, in this case, is this one, but uh, they can have more labels. If if I do show labels, I should be able to see all the labels they have. So basically, I will use those labels in order to match the pods to apply the network policies in, into them. And in the rule itself, I can uh, call these labels to match the traffic that is uh, in ingress or egress for that pod. So that's basically uh, how the uh, a Kubernetes network policy looks like. So let me go back and let's talk about, uh, I, we will see an example of this uh, working. So uh, this is a, uh, a sample application. The application is uh, yet another online bank or Java bank, the application that I just displayed right now. And the application has basically four pods, as you saw. Uh, if I go back to it, uh, there is four pods. One is a customer pod, uh, two summary pods, and one database. Uh, so basically, the customer pod is, is the one that provides the the UI, then I have the business logic and the database. So basically, uh, this. The, the, the flow of this application is uh, this, uh, I, I mean, people will be reaching this microservice, the customer pod, then this uh, customer pod will be only talking with the business logic pod, the summary. It doesn't need to go directly to the database. There is no reason I, I will uh, like this pod to get to the database because only the summary pod should be able to get to the database. So what we will do is uh, we will uh, do a very quick uh, demo of this. Uh, so for this, uh, let me just exit from here. So basically, uh, this is uh, well the same environment. Uh, I have those uh, for the the thing is that this is a jump server and this is uh, the master node. But uh, essentially, uh, I have the the four pods here. Uh, I'm just uh, you know entering the shell of them, one of them, and then I can see that I can. I uh, try to reach the database. In this case, I am doing a curl directly to the database. And as you can see, I'm retrieving a lot of uh, stuff. Let me just stop for a second, but uh, I'm retrieving, retrieving a, a, a lot of stuff about uh, accounts, uh, you know, balances and so on. So as you can see, there is nothing preventing this uh, customer pod in this case, or any other pod uh, by a matter of fact, to reach the database pod, right? So there is no, no policy implemented so uh, anyone can reach. So le let's leave this uh, core running for a second. Uh, and then we will implement a policy. I have two policies here. One is called database. And uh, basically it's, it's the same as uh, the same format as, as we saw before is a Kubernetes network policy uh, that, that the API tells, tells me that is a Kubernetes network policy, uh, kindness network policy. This is the name of the policy. It's a namespace. So this will be applied to endpoints that match the label that are in the Jiao Bank namespace. So this is my uh, selection criteria for those pods. So basically I'm matching a label and the label is a database. As you can see, the database has this label. So that pod will be matched by this policy. And basically there is this, uh, the policy that I am applying. So basically I am saying if the traffic comes from the summary, uh, the summary pod, which is the only one that should talk with the database and goes to the port of the database, TCP port of the database, then you will allow the traffic. Everything else will be denied. Uh, at this moment, what I am using is the customer pod, as you can see, I, I just entered uh, the shell of the customer pod. So this pod shouldn't get directly to the database. And that's what ba basically I'm trying to prevent. I'm, uh, I will apply uh, this policy now. So let's see uh, what's the effect of it. So if I create, uh, sorry, misspelled that, create uh, the database uh, policy, as you can see, uh, the database policy is applied. Now, this pod won't be able to communicate with the database pod. Only the summary pod 
will be able to do so. So basically here's, here we have uh, just shown an example of a Kubernetes network policy and uh, how that policy uh, will you know, help us to limit the traffic uh, you know, in our environment. So let me go back to the presentation again. So um, we have been talking about Kubernetes network policies, but it's important to know that Calico network policies, I mean, Kubernetes network policies were modeled after Calico network policies really. And Calico network policies are a bit uh, more rich uh, in terms of the things that can be done. Um, uh, one uh, example or one difference with a Calico network policy is that they do not need necessarily to be net namespace. They can be global in a scope. And that means that you can match endpoints no matter in which namespace they are. And then you will ask, uh, well, uh, uh, why I will need to have uh, policies that are global, that are not uh, namespace? Well, if you think about uh, best practices, because we were talking about best practices at the beginning of the uh, session, um, you will like probably to allow the traffic that you need and then uh, you know, uh, disable any other traffic in my, enable, I mean, I, I, in my network. I, I just want the pods uh, to talk only with the pods that they need to, and then uh, be able to control which other traffic uh, uh, you know, uh, I do, do not need, then I do not uh, want that communication to happen. So that's uh, usually what is called a zero trust approach. So uh, basically I, I would like to do that there is a, uh, in terms of uh, documentation, uh, there is um, some best practices here. I believe if you go to security, yeah, adopt a zero trust network model for security, get it started with policies. So if you are interested in knowing more about best practices and how to do this uh, approach, this is some reference links that you, you can read. But the essential is that, I mean, essentially uh, uh, one of the benefits, sorry, I wrong place. So one of the benefits uh, that making global policies have is that you can uh, ban the rest of the traffic if needed. Another thing is that you have deny, you, you have other kind of actions. You have deny actions, you have a log action. Uh, if, if you remember in the Kubernetes policy, you define the traffic, anything that is not defined by default will be denied. And that's good. That works for most of the, you know, the, 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 the things that you want to do. However, there will be uh, cases where imagine you have communication to one kind of traffic, and then you want to limit a subset of this traffic. You, you just want to limit a subset of this traffic. So doing that with a Kubernetes policy is really difficult. And sometimes there will be cases even where there is no real way to do this because we do not have an action, we do not have an order in this policy. I, I cannot say this policy will match first and this later on. So in Calico, there are two mechanisms that uh, facilitates this. One is the action. You can say, well, I deny part of the traffic and then I allow uh, the rest of that traffic. And then you can have an order. So imagine you uh, deny first uh, a subset of the traffic, then in a, sip, uh, in a following policy with a higher order, you allow everything else in that kind of traffic. So that, that's a quite nice way to, 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 um, to do your policies, right? So that's something that Calico policies can do. Uh, so actions, ordering, uh, it has more matching in terms of uh, protocols. Uh, it has, uh, it, you can match in service accounts. The, the pod uses a service account and you can match in whatever a, a service account was defined in the pod uh, to match that traffic if, if you want. And it has, uh, well, other integrations that uh, will allow you to do layer seven uh, rules and so on. But for that, probably you will, well, you will, in this case, you will need a service mesh uh, in order to do that. So, how Calico network policies look like? Well, basically uh, you can see this uh, network policy has a different API version or group. In this case is project Calico. Uh, it's a, a network policy. In this case, uh, I have two examples, one for a network policy and another for a global network policy. Uh, so this is the one that is not namespaced. As, wow. as you can see, there is a difference there. There is no namespace. So you have an order that you can order these policies. You have a selector uh, for that policy. Uh, that's common to both. And then, uh, well, you have different uh, matching criteria. Uh, in this case, uh, as you can see, these, uh, both of them are ingress policies, uh, the normal network policy and the global uh, one. 
And in this case, um, these uh, actions are different. In this case, I have an action. In Kubernetes policies, I do not have an action. In this case, I'm allowing this traffic, uh, the traffic that comes from the source uh, that matches this label. And in this case, I just I'm denying the traffic from a source and then allowing uh, other traffic that comes from a specific service account. I can match, uh, you know, in 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 the service in the label that I uh, gave to the service account in this case. So one important thing just to to finalize is that. Um, you know, as uh, as you can see, global network policies. I do not have a namespace. So in this case, I'm I'm selecting any endpoint, no matter in which namespace it is, that has this label. In this case, uh, even if I'm selecting these uh, endpoints with this label, it's just for this namespace. So if I have another endpoint with uh, or pod with a label color equal blue, but is in the default namespace, this policy won't match uh, that endpoint. So let's uh, go for a very quick demo in, in the Calico network policies. Uh, just give me a minute. So essentially, uh, let's apply. Uh, well, in order to apply, to demonstrate that policy, what I will do is, uh, for example, if I, I I'm just uh, denying the traffic uh, in the database pod, there is nothing really preventing the customer pod to try to get to any other place. So, for example, if I dig uh, Google in this case, I can see that uh, you know I can resolve uh, Google. So let's apply a default deny policy and you will see what that uh, effect that will have. But before I will show you how the default deny uh, looks like. So uh, basically I have the, that default deny will have an API version. Uh, it it has the kind is a global network policy. Uh, it doesn't have a namespace because it will match uh, all the points in all namespaces. And the type is ingress and egress. So that uh, policy will match, uh, in this case, there is no rule. So that means that the policy will uh, deny all the traffic uh, in ingress and egress because I do not have a rule denied. There is a one important thing here to mention is this is a best practice. When you implement a default deny network policy in Calico, and you will find that in the documentation, but uh, one uh, recommendation is that you use a namespace selector uh, because we can use a name, uh, we can uh, use a, not just a selector for the pods as we saw, but we can use a namespace selector. And then the namespace selector will have have, uh, you know, this uh, syntax. Basically, this is uh, preventing to use uh, any policy in, uh, you know, uh, naming spaces that has uh, these names, right? Uh, cube system or Calico system. Basically, what I'm trying to prevent to do is to implement these policies in any namespace that has critical components for Kubernetes. So I won't affect those. I will just apply this policy to everything else, right? And as you saw before, if I go back here, uh, let me just escape from here for a second. As you can see, my uh, Calico system uh, won't be uh, denied by this policy. When in this case, I, I should. Uh, have included probably Calico API servers uh, namespace as well, but well, none of these uh, namespaces will be uh, affected by by this policy. So let's uh, uh, just probably test that policy. I will uh, just uh, do a kubectl create uh, this policy, and then if I go back here to the customer pod, uh, then I will uh, not be able to get to Google anymore, right? So that's, uh, that's it. Let me just remove it for a second. And then that will set us for the next exercise. So I will just delete it. And now, well, I will be able to uh, dig. Cool. So that's uh, an example of a, a Calico network policy. And just to end uh, you know, the, the session today, we will talk about uh, the eBPF data plane, which is uh, something interesting as well. Um, so basically, uh, before setting the stage, before talking about eBPF, uh, I would like to talk about what control playing and data playing is. Uh, we have, uh, you know, control playing, uh, in which, uh, well, basically, is uh, in, in in case of networking software, control playing is uh, the ones that will handle their routing, how to reach those uh, networks. For example, where my the logic of my protocols, my routing protocols will be, uh, that's what will be the control playing. And the data playing is, uh, well, essentially, uh, you know, um, I mean, the, the first one is the network state and the, the data plane will represent actually the, the 
the traffic that I have in that uh, uh, in that network. So uh, Calico can uh, support several kinds of data planes, right? Even if Calico acts as a single control plane for them, you can plug different kinds of data planes uh, on it. And one uh, of them is eBPF. But even uh, uh, before going further, uh, let's uh, just briefly describe what this uh, eBPF is. eBPF is uh, extended uh, Berkeley packet filter. It, it was uh, done by the University of Berkeley. And then uh, initially it was, uh, it's a project that, that uh, I mean, a very old uh, mechanism. Uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, Born just to use um, to to be used as a packet filtering, uh, you know, so you can, you know, capture uh, at the kernel level, uh, you know, run programs at the kernel level that are able to uh, safe safely, so you can capture uh, packets. But it has been extended, so that means that uh, initially BPF uh, Berkeley packet filtering was extended, so you can run virtually any program. It, it doesn't need to be a network. Uh, related program. It can be uh, anything, right? So basically, it's a, a, a Linux kernel feature that lets you to run in, uh, small programs inside the Linux kernel. So how this works? Well, basically, they these um, programs uh, run in a in a virtual machine in the eBPF uh, virtual machine the chips with the Linux kernel, and then they do not need they they need to pass a validation. So uh, every time you run a program, there is a validation that will look for things like uh, if the program has the right uh, permission levels to run. Uh, yeah, for example, if it needs root permission to, to run and it doesn't have it, then it, it will simply fail or it, it will check for things like loops. I mean, you cannot have a loops in those kind of programs. So there will be a series of validations that will be done against this uh, eBPF program before it can run in, into the kernel. So um, the, the way it uh, works is it, it attaches to several hooks and is event uh, driven, which is important as well. So there will be syscalls, for example, that will make that this uh, eBPF uh, program will run, for example. So the most important thing about the BPF is that it doesn't need uh, the kernel uh, source code to change in order to to work, right? So you do not need uh, really to wait for the next kernel release in order to run your program, or you do not need to load any module into the kernel. So it, it helps with the fast, uh, uh, the pace of innovation, right? You can uh, just hook your eBPF programs there. There will be standard validations that will be done against that program. And if uh, it doesn't comply to those, uh, it will simply not run. And then the thing is that it uh, is included, uh, you know, with those uh, kernel versions. Uh, 5.4 and for Red Hat uh, kernel uh, for 18.193. Those are the kernel versions. So uh, as I was saying, Calico supports several kinds of data planes. Uh, basically, we offer four kinds of, of data planes mainly. Uh, we can work with Linux uh, or Windows, uh, you know, uh, data planes, uh, or uh, in, in this case, we'll be, be using IP tables in order to enforce those network policies or IPVS, if you're uh, using it for the services I, I'm talking about for IPVS, uh, for everything else can be IP tables or for the network policies, IP tables as well. Uh, Windows HNS, if you are using uh, Windows nodes, you can have Windows nodes running in a Kubernetes environment where you have a Linux master, but your worker nodes can be uh, Windows based. And then uh, we support Linux eBPF or Linux VPP, which is a high performance uh, data plane as well, which is currently in, in tech preview. So those are the data planes. And then the advantage of this is that you can uh, use the same control plane that we build uh, Calico for those different data planes. So you will reuse the, the same code in order to, to uh, enforce those network policies and uh, you know, move those packets uh, through the network. And then uh, basically is, uh, you, know, you, you minimize the, the required uh, you know, code uh, for the data plane itself. Uh, so basically Calico will use the same uh, uh, logic uh, uh, or uh, reuse of the, that control plane. Um, yeah, there's uh, uh, future proofing and uh, agility for uh, probably that's the most important one, especially when we are talking about uh, Linux eBPF. So um, some characteristics of the eBPF data plane, well, is that it scales uh, better. It has a higher throughput. It uses less CPU per uh, gigabyte, uh, gigabit in this case, gigabit per second. Uh, 
then uh, has native uh, support for Kubernetes uh, services. Uh, so it preserves the external client source IP. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, we, we will see how that works and support something that is called a direct server return uh, and then use less uh, CPU than QProxy. When we are talking about services, instead of using QProxy, QProxy uses IP tables under the hood in order to redirect the services. In this case, uh, you know, uh, it, it will be done by eBPF. So as you can see, the connect connection time of uh, TCP connection will increase as uh, we grow in terms of the the amount of IP tables needed in order to handle those connections. If I am using QProxy, I will redirect the Kubernetes services by means of QProxy. Uh, in case of IPVS, uh, well, it's, it's, it's steady, but even so I can get a benefit using eBPF uh, and doesn't matter uh, if I increase the, the number of services that uh, are in my Kubernetes cluster backed by uh, Kubernetes pods, uh, you know, the performance uh, will, be, will be the same. So uh, I, I will have two couple of diagrams and then we'll, we'll check uh, the environment and that will uh, likely end this, this session. I just want to, to talk about two features that are uh, specific to, to EBPF, which are really uh, nice and important to understand. And in order to explain that, I will explain how this uh, connectivity, for example, is handled by QProxy when you are not running eBPF. And what is the difference with eBPF? So let, let's assume or imagine you have an external client and this external client needs to access uh, a pod. So uh, you are balancing a service, right? You probably are exposing that uh, pod service and, and then uh, you are uh, accessing that service from an external client. So you will get to your service and that uh, service will be probably uh, exposed that as a node port in, in your Kubernetes node. So it will hit a, a node uh, let's assume that that node is not the one that is running the pod. So in that case, if your external client goes to that uh, Kubernetes node, it will, well, basically QProxy will use the NAT table in order to find out which uh, endpoint uh, you need to reach uh, your, uh, uh, you know, your, your pod for that is back in that service. Uh, every service is backed by a pod. So for example, if I go back to to here, just to very quickly show you, if I go to my services, uh, I have uh, several services here. So for example, but for my uh, database service, this is the IP of the service of the database service, but I uh, that, that service is, um, you know, handled by several endpoints. This is my database endpoint. So really that service is being backed by this endpoint and QProxy will use IP tables, the NAT table in order to get there to uh, probably, uh, I mean, basically redirect me to, to that endpoint. So once it does that, uh, I, I lost the original IP, right? I cannot see the original IP of the client uh, because uh, you know I, I have been natted by the uh, incoming uh, node in this case. So the node has natted the connection, has sent the, the request to the uh, final pod, and then the pod needs to get back to the original node. So the NAT will be reversed, right? I, I need to hair pin this connection to this node. So the source and destination has changed in the connectivity, right? Uh, once I, I got to the port and I, uh, you know, uh, responded to that traffic. That is an example with QProxy. Let's see how that works in eBPF. So basically in eBPF, the external client would go, potentially will be balanced to one of the nodes, but there will be a BPF program, uh, you know, being run by Calico that will respond, respond to an event, uh, pro probably to an interruption on, 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 you know, uh, on that node. And then uh, basically it will, you know, see we, where that, service needs to be ser serviced with pod should back that service and then we'll send the traffic to that uh, destination node. So once it sends the traffic to the destination node, uh, then uh, the, the NAT will happen there, right? Because I, I just basically want to NAT the service IP to the endpoint destination. So I will do the NAT in the destination pod and I can do that because I am running uh, eBPF. So eBPF basically under the hood, what it happens is it opens a VXLAN connection to the other node, sends a packet uh, encapsulated, the original road to packet, it does the NAT, it sends the, the, the traffic, the traffic is sent to the destination pod and then the BPF program, the eBPF program 
can uh, you know, do reverse the NAT directly. So that means that I do not need to get back to the original node because I have done the NAT locally in that node where the pod is running. So I can reverse the NAT there and then send the traffic directly to the external client. So there are two important concepts here. One is the IP preservation of the original IP. And the second important concept here is uh, that I can do direct server return. This is what is called direct server return because I, I do not need to hairpin my traffic to the uh, original node. So that's basically it. I mean, in a nutshell, uh, the probably two of the most, uh, apart from throughput, two of the most important advantages, advantages of eBPF. eBPF has a lot of, uh, you know, uh, potential, right? I, I can, as I can jo just run programs, uh, you know, at the current safely uh, in a sandbox uh, kind of uh, way in my kernel. So uh, it, it can extend, you know, the ability of that data plane very easily. So I can easily implement uh, future things if I need in eBPF. But those are in, in terms of networking uh, perspective, probably the most common ones. So let's see uh, how that works. I uh, probably, let me just go back to my pods and probably I will uh, go to my customer pod. Uh, for a second, and then I don't know if I right now can I, I don't know if I can get there. I, I believe I uh, okay, or or policy is still in place, so that traffic should be being denied. So, what I will do is um, we will enter into a Calico node. I mean, that that uh, customer port is running in this node, so in node uh, 226. So, I will go to the Calico node uh, where that. A pod is running and I, I will run, uh, but, but before doing that, let me see which uh, address my pod has. Uh, the database pod has this address. So if I do Calico node uh, BPF and then I do contract dump and probably grep in this IP, I will see that uh, you know uh, eBPF, as, as you can see, I am using eBPF in order to send those connections to the destination pod. And in this case, um, uh, you know, uh, I see some uh, white white list falls uh, means that well, basically these uh, connections are being uh, blocked by this uh, rule. So uh, for that, what I will do is uh, probably I will get out here, and then uh, probably remove the network policy that I just created. And then uh, probably we can get back, back in. And this was the node that we tried before. And as you can see, uh, now it's, it's white, white listed, right? So it's, it's basically uh, allowing that connection. So this should be working now. So basically I'm using eBPF in order to, to send this. Uh, wh where do you define, do you want to use uh, eBPF? There are uh, several steps that you need to, there are basically three steps that you need to do in order to enable the BPF. One is creating a config map. And this uh, config map is important because uh, this config map basically what will do is will tell uh, how to, to Calico node, how to reach, uh, uh, how to reach uh, the, the API server because now you won't uh, rely in, in, um, in QProxy in order to get there. Uh, so you need to create a config map. Uh, the second thing that you need to do is get rid of QProxy. As you can see in this environment, uh, there is no QProxy. I mean, I, I, I'm basically, well, I have, uh, let me see if I, those are the config maps, but not the pods. Uh, let's see in a minute. Pods. If I go back here, yeah, there is no cube proxy pod in my cube system. So cube proxy, I mean, uh, the other ones that I was displaying was just the config map. So I create a config map to tell Calico Node how to reach the Kubernetes API server. Then I get rid of cube proxy. And then the, in the installation resource that we saw before, the same, <laughs> I like that picture, uh, installation resource. Uh, in the installation resource default. Uh, basically, this is the same installation re uh, uh, resource that we used before. If I scroll down a bit, uh, let me see where it is. Um, yeah, as you can see, this is the one that we modified it on the environment. We said, well, we want to use uh, uh, 1048 was in that case. In this case, it's uh, 10244. 
the encapsulation and so on, but this is the parameter that will tell me uh, which uh, data plane I need to use. So I can go and patch this resource. So the, the steps are create the config map. So Calico will know how to reach uh, you know, the API server service once I get rid of QProxy. The second thing is get rid of QProxy. So QProxy won't be used anymore. And then I enable a BPF, a BPF uh, data plane. So that, that's basically the three steps that you will use in order to enable uh, eBPF. So I believe um, just a recap of uh, eBPF. eBPF is an alternative uh, data plane for Linux. It has a higher uh, throughput in terms of CPU, have a lower latency, which generally is uh, something that people is looking for. It preserves the source IP as you saw, because I run you know, uh, that um, NAT in destination NAT uh, really in the destination so, uh, node where the pod is running. So I, I, I can preserve the source IP of uh, the external client, which is good for web server logs, which is good for policy, network policy as well, because I can match in the source, in the original source IP in my network policies, which is nice. And then is a kube proxy replacement and it supports direct server return uh, on support of fabrics. So